I imagine that once the epilogue had been heard during rehearsal, during performance, it probably made a prologue necessary. What is extraordinary is the way that the two sound different once you've been through the work, even though the music is exactly the same. There is something moving in the final separation of the voice and the horn. When you've been working together with the horn player throughout the piece, suddenly you're separated. The horn player walks off the stage. You sing the sonnet, and in response to the sonnet, the, the horn player plays the epilogue. And that's the most wonderful piece of imaginative writing, I think. During the course of the serenade, one seems to go on a journey for me, the pastoral is simple. It's not dark in meaning. Then the nocturne is about dying, and I think that it's darker than I realized. Then the elegy, the blank, very, very dark indeed, very painful. Beauty turns to rottenness, and the dirge is terrifying. The hymn is incongruously light and wonderful after that, and I think perfectly placed. And then the sonnet to sleep, where the listener or whomever achieves sleep, should be the end. But then this framing epilogue with an unseen player has a quite wonderful effect. I've actually played the prologue prologue and epilogue at my father's memorial service and also that of a friend, William Golding. And uh, actually Golding's daughter wrote me a letter in which she said how the sound of the horn, which is produced by the breath, and she noted that breath and soul are the same word in Latin animus. And she said the listener can be taken somewhere away by this sound, which has no observable source, 